Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, you are now tuned into the Prince of Investment coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado, via the beautiful city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii. So ladies and gentlemen, today we got a very interesting guest. As you can see, we have, you know, I like to highlight entrepreneurs that are out here doing great things that can give insight, that can also motivate and to see what great people are doing around the globe, which is very important. So today, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. So today we have the CEO of Sisters in Sales. Sisters in Sales is, a, uh, is an organization that aims to put women in sales positions, sales positions and marketing positions. So they have a up, well, they've done so many great events, but they have the upcoming fifth annual event that's going to be in New York. Just came from New York a couple weeks ago. But it's going to be in New York this year in September. So we have the CEO of Sisters in Sale, Ms. Chantel Jacobs here. She's here today. We're going to talk to her, how she did it, what this organization is about, and also give career advice to people coming up in the sales world and how does she put this organization together, getting partnerships with, I don't want to get too far in it. But anyway, let me bring in my guest, Ms. Chantel. How are you doing today, ma'am? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you for joining us uh, live today. You're in New York City, correct? Yes, I am. Okay, nice. Well, the first thing I want to get into, uh, for I kind of gave a brief introduction, Sisters in Sales. Can you tell us about it? Sure, thank you. So I actually founded Sisters in Sales five years ago because I worked in the sales industry and I had a difficult time finding mentorship, sponsorship, navigating corporate politics, and I knew that sales was very lucrative but I didn't know how to fully map out my career in it. So Sisters in Sales is the largest network of black, brown women in professional sales. And we have been supported by the largest brands in the world that care a lot about closing this diversity gap, like Google, like Microsoft, like TikTok, like Salesforce, for example. Um, last year, in fact, you mentioned the conference, last year, 28 partners came to join us in advocating for black women in sales. Okay. Now, recently here, you just did a partnership with Walmart um, coming up for your event. I think it was the, the makeup line that's in there that people that intend, that attend, they can have, you know, access to, um, you know, doing the makeup while they're getting so much knowledge in the sales industry. Can you break down to us, what is this Walmart, Walmart partnership? How does that look for Sisters in Sales? Sure. So it's actually Walmart Connect which is the omni-channel marketing group within Walmart. And they have access to Walmart's resources, of course, like Walmart's Black-owned beauty brand, uh, Luna Magic. And so while the attendees are learning about how to become better sales professionals, they can get makeup touch-ups at the conference over the, over the course of the three days. Okay. So putting this organization together, when you, you said that, hey, I was seeking out mentorship, and I was going up the ladder, I saw less people that look like me, females, you saw less females, and you saw less minorities, and you was trying to figure out this uh, thing and put it together. How did you put this thing piece, piece by piece? Did you just, hey, you know, uh, just created a Facebook group? What did you do? The million dollar question. I get mm -hmm. asked that question a lot. So um, I'll take you through it. I actually started with the dinner. I started with getting women around me that were in sales and I just wanted to pick their brain. In fact, I, I didn't know that it was going to grow to this degree. Um, so I was looking to just have a small engagement and, and leave it at that. But then I met a woman at Salesforce who said, why don't you have a public event and you can host it here? And I said, sure. And I expected to see same 10 women who were, you know, talking about their career show up, but it actually ended up being over a hundred. And so primarily through word of mouth, no marketing. And I realized this was an actual real problem that we had to solve. And the rest was really history. We just kept programming and kept putting on events. Five years later, we just had an event in Accra in Ghana um, about two weeks ago. We'll be doing events in Atlanta in a few weeks with Google. I mean, we are going around the world and uniting Black women in sales together. Nice. And I see you have something come in, in London, if I'm not mistaken. Did I read that correctly? Right. So we'll be what launching- What you have going on in London as well? We'll be launching in London as well. Actually, one of our strategic hires, Hannah X. Jowell, um, is in London. 
and um, she has been creating a network there as well um, and has been establishing partnership too. Okay, so how can people get involved with with Sisters in Sales? Come to our website, but more importantly, come to our conference. Mm. September 21st to the 23rd um, will be clean. And the biggest, I think, takeaway from this is what we're going to be talking about. Um, historically, I've created content based upon what's going on in the macro and micro economy. And right now, the biggest thing that's on everyone's mind is the state of the economy. And so we will have a whole day dedicated to financial literacy and financial wellness. In fact, Walmart is going to be spearheading a lot of that, that conversation because in sales, your money can go up and down. It really depends on how well you perform that month, that quarter, or that year. Um, but we need to be great at not just doing the work, but also saving our money and investing wisely. And our community can benefit from that. So. Um, it's the sales conference, yes, but it's also skills to help you become um, a better adult and manage your life a lot better. Okay. So what would be your advice? Someone is just saying, hey, I just graduated. I just got my bachelor's degree in marketing and I want to get into the marketing world. I always hear that sales is the number one way to get in. What advice would you would you give this? I'm asking this question because uh, one of the guys, uh, I know he just recently graduated uh, from college and he has a marketing degree. He always asks me all the time. I'm like, I don't really know what to say, but I'm glad to have you on. What would you, what advice would you give to him? Fail fast. I mean, no one's going to get it right the first time. And I, I used to make 80 to 100 cold calls a day just to get my pitch right. And I think it's about communication. And the only way to do that is to continue practicing it. Like not even a child learns the English language overnight. Be prepared to work really hard at your communication skills and your pitching, and you will be successful. Okay. Is there any courses or books you recommend that you like that say, hey, if you're going to get into sales or marketing, is there any way you kind of got them there? I like two books. I like the Challenger Sale. It's a tried and true book on how to work with customers and how to have a point of view, even though it might come across different than what the customer might think that they want. Um, I also like Unapologetically Ambitious. Um, that book is written by uh, Shelly, Shelly and Archibald, and it's basically a guideline for how to plan your life and also work up the corporate ladder um, in the eyes, in the lens of a woman. So I think those are two books that I really hold near and dear. Okay. So with events going on in Ghana, also events going on in London, Atlanta, September, coming back to New York City, what are some of the, uh, what is next for Sisters in Sales? Where do you see this going now? This thing that started as a little dinner, what's next? Well, first we're celebrating um, raising, um, bootstrapping, I should say, a million dollars in sponsorship sales um, as of this year. So yeah. that is one of our biggest accomplishments. We're on track to do $2 million in in revenue, which is unbelievable and a largely due to our sales team effort. Um, and the second thing is to get to 30,000 women by 2028, who are currently at 5,500. Okay, nice. Another thing is when you're looking at, let's say from the entrepreneur side of the house, whatever product they may have, like, you know, I always tell people, and I believe that I read this in, um, I think he wrote a book called, I think it was Next Five Moves, or maybe it was The Way of the Wolf. Jordan Belfort wrote a book called The Way of the Wolf about sales. Now, the thing that he always said is that, you know, the lifeline, the revenue of a company, the bloodline is through sales, right? You know, sales and marketing kind of go hand in hand, even though people kind of treat sales, you know, different from marketing. But if someone is that entrepreneur hiring the sales team, how do they know which sales team to hire? Or, you know, any advice on that to entrepreneurs that are looking to get into that sales world to say, hey, you know what, maybe I can get a sales team behind my particular product. There are different types of sellers. Um, there are sellers that are very process oriented. You give them a script, they'll read the script, they'll use the template. Um, and I think that you need someone like that on your team, of course. But there are also folks that like to do it their own way. I think the sellers on my team sit within that bucket. I'll give them some guidance, but they'll remake it their own. I'll create that and they'll redo the deck. And it gives them confidence to have their own spin on what they do. So I would look out for people that are not afraid 
to challenge you, not afraid to ask questions because you're curious and you want your sellers to be bought into your vision. Um, and, they, and you know they're bought into your vision when they start putting their own take on everything that you do. And I, as a leader, I actually encourage that. Okay. You know, now, you know, with the big push that we have now recently with the diver diversity and inclusion, how does Sister in Sales um, and yourself too, Chanel, like, Chanel, about how do you feel people, how can companies tackle this issue that so many corporations and companies and groups are trying to, you know, find now with getting more minority women into sales position, executive position, things like that? Well, first we have to acknowledge that it's not a matter of um, lack of interest in the industry. It definitely boils down to the lack of mentorship, guidance, and understanding of corporate politics. The same thing that I mentioned at the top of this interview. Um, you may have actually a lot of diverse professionals in the entry level stage, but when it comes to figuring out how to become a sales manager or how to become a vice president of sales, you actually need someone to teach you the internal politics, someone to teach you the unspoken rules, someone to tell you, hey, you should talk to Mr. Smith and take him out for a drink and you know talk about your family and this, these are the kind of things he likes. And while you're doing that, ask him when he's hiring for his team. This type of guidance is not happening with diverse employees, particularly because we need someone who looks like us to have those conversations with us. So I always push back on the fact that um, it's, it's not because of the lack of people that want to be in this, it's about the lack of, of um, more seasoned professionals that can shepherd the entry level and the mid-level employees through the process. Okay. Well, we're gonna take a quick break and I mean a very quick break. Um, and we're gonna come back here and talk more about Sisters in Sales and Ms. Chantel here live with us today, all the way from New York City. I'm from Denver, Colorado. So we're gonna take a break. We'll be right back after the break. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, we're now back here live. The Prince of Investment is always, I'm your gracious host, the Prince of Investing, Prince Dykes, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from Denver, Colorado, via Honolulu, Hawaii. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button wherever you may be catching this, catching it live, or the playback. If you saw the beginning of this episode, the beginning of the show, we are talking to Ms. Chantel Jacobs about sisters in sales. She sat down and wanted mentorship and guidance into the sales industry. When a story came across my desk, I like people who don't talk about things, but go out and actually do something to challenge the status quo. And to actually not to seem like, hey, whoa, little me, but look what I'm doing about it. So she started something with a little dinner that turned into a conference that uh, she's going to her fifth annual conference, the first conference back from the COVID, right? Turned it internationally out in Ghana, London, Atlanta. Very proud of her, very glad to highlight her. But she's very inspirational, but she has a great story because we know you not, you want to know who you're dealing with, you wanna connect with certain people. So Ms. Chantel, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your background? Sure, so I was born in the Bronx, New York to two uh, parents from the Caribbean. And they instilled a lot of really values in me, um, the importance of leaning on your network to help get by. Um, they were a little bit more old school and conservative, 
So they were big on um, manners and being respectful. So that was, they created a cocoon for me in a really, I would say, broadly difficult neighborhood. And I was very thankful for that. Okay, well, that's good. And your childhood coming up in that, you know, childhood of, you know, that conservative background, um, your dad, you spoke about your dad having a, been a big influence on you. Why was your dad, a, shout out to Father's Day, but also, why was your dad a big influence on you? Well, I, when I was growing up, he was already retired. So he was a building inspector for 25 years. And um, he had me later in life. And so when I was born, he was already out of the workforce. And I watched a man have a second career, and that was entrepreneurship. Um, he wasn't the type of man to just wait around. So he started a business, and he used what he got from that career he had as a building inspector, and he took that information and started buying and flipping homes because he understood how the system worked. And I was always inspired by that. Um, I learned a lot that you always have a lot more to give and a lot more to teach and a lot more that you can create for other people to join in. Um, and even when he was buying homes, fixing them and flipping them, he actually had a lot of my cousins and his nephew help him. And so that was a lot of generational information transfer that he was able to do up until he passed away. Oh, sorry to hear that he uh, passed away, but his legacy still remains. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you're carrying on the torch of I know he's looking at you and probably guiding you every day of, you know, like, wow, look at it. You know, look at my daughters out here, you know, tearing it up across the globe and changing things. Now, I want to ask you, uh, Chantel, like, you know, what legacy one day that you would like to leave behind? What would be your mark you would like to leave on this earth? I don't want anyone who's watching what I'm doing to think that they can't do it, too. I think. If, if there's anything that I can leave on this earth would be we all can make the change that we want to see. Just take patience. And I I also want people to know that you don't have to change who you are to be successful. I went through a, a phase in my life where I thought I had to speak differently. I had to do things differently. I had to show, I had to be more stoic in my personality. And the truth is that's just not me. And I'm, I, the way I'm speaking to you, the way I speak to customers, the way I speak to my team, it is refreshing. I feel very liberated, and yet we are still very successful. So you do not have to change who you are. You do not have to change how you present yourself. Be successful. That authenticity that you have is actually what's very magnetic. I, I, you know, I got to second that, you know, because so many, you know, I was talking, you know, coming from even in my personal situation, coming from the deep south of Georgia, Waynesboro, Georgia, right? Um, people always said, hey, you have to look this way, talk this way, act this way, do this to be able to be successful, right? I think we all kind of taught that to a certain degree. But when you do that, you start to lose your, who you are, you know, I always tell people, do new things, but put your spin on it. Like for prime example, for me, Thursday it's my first day of golf class, right? I'm going to get into golfing. So I'm taking my first day of golf class, but I'm going to have, it's, I'm still going to be me. I'm just going to be golfing. I'm not going to change who I am to golf, but it's, hey, I, you can do something new, but to kind of keep that authenticity to yourself. Yeah. Now, looking back, let's say, looking at your younger version of you, when you walked out and you got your first job with your dad, right? And you got into sales. What is something today that you would tell the younger version of you or that you maybe would have done different? What advice would you give the younger version of Chantel? Uh, pay attention. Um, I, yeah. I, I was, I always wanted to just skip past stages. I was, I had difficulty staying in the moment. You know, um, I, I'll never forget this one lesson. When I moved into my own apartment and I was, Decided to you know move out of my parents' house and and um, start my life. My dad came over with tools that he could change the outlet from two prongs to three prongs so that I could use more electronics. And I was like, oh, I'm I'm finally free. Like, let me have the space to spread my wings. Stay. 
you know, um, because of course, a few weeks later, I realized I couldn't plug in my blow dryer, I couldn't plug in my straightening iron, I couldn't plug in my curling iron. And, you know, I think, you know, when you're growing up, you just want to skip so quickly. You don't want to pay attention. You don't want to live in the moment. And you don't think that you think you know better than your parents. You think you know better than adults. And I always think back and say to myself, I wish I just moved a little slower at those times and was willing to take feedback at those times. And I don't make those mistakes anymore because feedback is such a gift. Okay. So you're saying that uh, trust the process. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes adults, you know, elders know best, and that's okay. <laughs> you know? you- they do say that, and people always say, oh, the, the I forgot what the other coin phrase was, the the lesson is in the process or the lessons in the, you know, something like that, right? And it's something to say, and it's, you know, it's something fun to hear and say once you get over the hill. Yeah. But when you are going through it, because, you know, life is, I always tell life, life, I feel as though life is just an experience, you know? Yeah. We have, we all have an experience, and, you know, I love talking to old people. Because they've been there, they've done that, and they, you know, they like my dad, you know, I'm lucky to still have him. He always tells me, like, look, son, don't make the mistake I had. I fought to have the perfect life, not realizing that life was an imperfect journey. Mm. So he was like, just enjoy the process. It'll never be perfect. You know, I thought that, hey, I try to have the perfect marriage. Then as soon as I got the marriage together, then I try to have the perfect kids. Then I had you guys. Then as soon as I got the kids together, then the marriage was here. Then I wanted the career. Then I wanted the job. So it's just, then I realized when I got older, like, you know what? It's just all a journey and an experience. Don't stress out about it. It's all part of life. So that's good that you say trust the process. Now, uh, you know, like you spoke about going forward, looking at, um, you know, gaining new you know, sponsorships, bringing in $2 million. Congratulations to that. You know, I definitely got to put in a sound effect for that. $2 million revenue. That is definitely a, a pretty big thing to to accomplish. Now, I got to ask this question. I don't want it to rub you the wrong way, but I got to ask is the hard question. Why do you think people in maybe in your space are not as successful? People in my space. So other founders of networks and conferences. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that, um, you know, we're as a founder, our job as, as a CEO, I feel like my job is 20% my particular point of view and 80% what the community actually needs. Um, if it were up to me and if I wasn't paying attention to what the community needs, I would just put on a bunch of sales panels with really nicely dressed women in red bottoms talking about, you could be like me one day. And visually, it would look nice. It would take you to get a lot of photos, but no one in the audience walk away with any action items or tactical items. Having a day uh, in the conference dedicated to financial literacy isn't very sexy. Having a day in the conference dedicated to sales acumen isn't sexy either, or a day in the conference dedicated to accountability, but it's what our community needs. And so I'm paying attention to what we need and I'm giving it to them. And that's why we have such high attendance and how high turnout. But some conference founders won't adjust their programming because they want things to look a particular way. And that's where you lose interest and you lose your base mm. because not meeting people where they actually are. Um, you know, I'm sure we are all aware that the, the economy is going through a ton of volatility. If your conference isn't talking about economic disruption, then you're not timely or relevant at all. And so you just have to be people where they are in this current state. Okay. That's very uh, note- noteworthy because, you know, I've been at a ton of conferences and some conferences just seems like, Hey, we're here to sell a ticket, you know, let's get some draws and then we can sell some tickets and that's it. Thank you for coming next. And then some conferences are more built on like, no, we want you to get something out of this. We want to take you here. and that's a very good uh, note for the thing. And that's why you're successful. Another question I got to ask for you, what is the future of sales? Is there, you know, technology or what's coming up next in the world of sales? Or is it one of those industries that's like the newspaper? The newspaper has been around, not the newspaper, I'm sorry, books. 
books have been around for centuries and they're still here. Is there a new way or new thing that's coming out in sales? You know, I actually think that sales is becoming cyclical again. So I would say in the earlier times that sellers used to be um, known for having a Rolodex, right? Like if you have a Rolodex customers, companies would fight over you because they thought that would help those companies grow. Um, and then for a second, we actually did away with that type of thinking until now I think it's making a, a resurgence. Um, and I, I believe companies are looking for, for sellers to have a personal brand. They want to feel like you have your Rolodex, you have your personal brand together, you are active on LinkedIn. This is, this is cyclical in the sense that we're back kind of measuring sellers based upon their network, but also with technology allows people to have a professional brand online. Companies are now looking at individuals that have a strong professional brand. And even if you don't know everything, they are still being more bought into you, which I think is a very good thing. So like you, you asked me about um, what someone graduating college might want to do. Now they can have a great headshot. They can talk about all the things they did in their internships, all the things they did in college and position themselves as someone worth, worth hiring for a great job because of how they, they show up on the internet. And I think that is a wonderful thing. Like I said, part of that is, is going back in time when your network was really how people hired sellers and also using technology to help you shape how you look to these employers, which is a beautiful thing. And I hope everybody takes advantage of that. Okay. So I need to get me a headshot done. I need to update my LinkedIn. You know, I need to be willing to learn, trust the process, yeah, right? right? Got it, got it. Now, Ms. Chantelman, Ms. how can people find you, get more of you, keep in contact with you, all those other things before we get out of here today? Well, you can email us info at sistersandsales.com um, or check out our website at sistersandsales.com. Okay, all right. Um, well, is there anything you want to leave with the audience uh, for people that's catching this live or the playback? Join us at the summit. We would love to have you. It's for everyone, and the education is uh, is very important and timely. Okay, right here we have it broadcasted of being able to see it, Sisters in Sales, the fifth annual conference. Head over to their website. You got to her login information. Um, definitely very inspirational story. Um, definitely, I love the action. You know, many people talk. Very few people take action. Taking the action to do something, leaving your mark on this earth, giving you great things to help people out. And Chantel, I got to ask you one question. What about the guys in sales? I got to ask this question. That, what I what that about question the guys? Time. You know, Prince, you are more than welcome to start <laughs> a sales group. If there's right. anything you've learned from today's podcast, the world is yours. So okay. Like so, guys, you are that. welcome to come as well. But thank you for highlighting the sisters in sales. Thank you for what you're doing, and congratulations on all your success. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, to the next video podcast, cartoon, book, or whatever else crazy you see me doing around the globe, you guys know my name is Prince Dykes. I'm the Prince of Investment. Peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.